I said, well, I'm willing to come here and run this biomedical laboratory for a, a couple of years to get it straightened out for you if you want to. But the problem is, that's not what I want to do. And he said, if you can make this thing work, then you can do anything you please. What an offer from the head of the research department. And I said, well, what I please to do is something that will shock you. And he said, what is that? And he said, I said, well, I intend to start training everybody in how to tell the body what to do. And he, and he says, all right, you can tell the muscles. Everybody knows you can train the muscles. I said, yeah, but I want to train the involuntary nervous system. Because a lot of people have blood flow problems and that had nothing to do with the muscles. That is, the voluntary muscles. He says, that will never work. I said, yes, it will work because the guy in Germany by the name of Johannes Schultz in 1910 demonstrated that it would work. And in those days it was called hypnosis. And the body would change if the doctor would talk to the patient in, such, in, a, in the proper way. And since he had already done it, the only thing that he didn't do was he didn't use any feedback information so the, the, the patient didn't often it would you know, go into a hypnotic trance and they couldn't even remember afterwards what the doctor had said. And so what I said is we have to bring all of this to consciousness so it's self-regulation. Mm -hmm. That was the whole deal. And Gardner said, well, I'll, I'll believe it when, when I see it. And it happened that one of the people who came in as a research subject had a migraine headache. And while I was measuring blood flow and heart rate and all that sort of thing. Then what happened was all of a sudden there was a huge blood flow change in her body, in her, in her, in her hands. And, and I said to her afterwards, what happened to you two minutes ago? And she said, how did you know my migraine went away? And there was an increase of blood in the hands. And so that was the clue. Mm -hmm. And so then immediately then we started training people to make blood flow to the hands, which were not hard to do. Put a little thermometer on the hand and say, make it get hotter. And it did. And right away, all of, uh, right away, as a matter of fact, every patient we, that we worked with got over their migraine. Matter of fact, of the first 13 people that we tried it on, it worked on 12 perfectly. And was this something that uh, just kind of presented itself to you? You didn't set out to develop this. No, no, it happened with that, with that person in the lab who said, how did you know my migraine went away? So I started studying all the records and I saw the, how the blood flow had changed and that the, the blood had gone out of the head and they had gone to the hands. So I thought, well, in that case, all we have to do is train it. Then I found out that the blood flow, too much blood flow in the head is, is, called, is a, hmm, what did we call it? It was a stress response. Now when people get stressed, their face gets red but if you unstress them, the blood goes back out of the face and goes down into the arms and legs. So then we just started training people to do that. And when Gardner Murphy saw that, he was impressed. And so was everybody else mm -hmm. at, in the research department that, Mar that Murphy was connected with. But y you can imagine, nobody around the country believed that. <laughs> it took a long time before they, before they really began to believe it. Pat was teaching uh, people how to, how to use biofeedback. And the reason was the prison system in Kansas had some people in it 
that needed some psychological help. And Gardner Murphy was asked to do something. And he asked me if, if I knew anybody who uh, could uh, help. And I said, well, I have, I have a daughter who has a PhD in, in this kind of psychology and she could help. And so then she met uh, with the uh, prison officials and they gave her a job. So she then starts training these prisoners. Then what happened was <clears throat> one of the prisoners, then when he got out, uh, became a school teacher. And he remembered Pat and he said, we need her in school. So then they gave her a job and she then started uh, training kids. Uh, first out of town and then in Topeka. And so then, uh, so the, the question came up then finally about the movie. Well, okay, so the yogis can do this, but can anybody else do this? And I said, sure, any grade school kid can, can do this. And they said, oh yeah. I said, sure, I have a daughter who's training grade school kids. And so then they brought Pat in and she ended up training, uh, showing the children. And the children were having a great time because they could do it. They could do in in one week, they could do what a lot of adults were taking a month to learn. Mm -hmm. They could do it, some of them could do it in one day. We'd say, warm your hands. And, say, and they wouldn't know that was impossible. So they, and they'd say, how do you do it? And, and all I would ever say is, <clears throat> imagine the blood going to your fingers. And then, and in 20 minutes, the blood would be going to their fingers. Some people took weeks to learn that. And one doctor who had trouble with high blood pressure, and we always had to get rid of it by starting to train the fingers first, and then the feet, and then the blood pressure would drop. Took him two years to learn how to warm his hands before he could at will just say, get, get warm. And they would get warm and his heart rate would change and the blood pressure would change, but it took him two years. And so finally he said to me, how come it took me two years to learn this thing that some of these kids can learn in two weeks? I said, your problem is you're a doctor. You already know what can't be done which is false. It was pretty entertaining. After we did the biofeedback thing <coughs> enough, then people start saying to me, how come some people are healers? And I said, because of the fact that the physical body is only the covering. The real body is the energy body called the etheric body. And when somebody says healing by the laying on of hands, you put your hands on somebody and the energy comes out of the body and go down into their body and makes the changes. Healing by the laying on of hands, that's no big deal. I mean, think of all the records there are. And so I said, why don't we try to test this and see if we can measure this energy so we got healers, some really outstanding healers. About 15 of them came to Menninger at my invitation. And they came there and I wired them up and, and I thought, we gotta, how are we gonna measure this? So we surrounded them with all these copper walls, above and below and then front and in back. And then all these copper walls were set up on glass blocks so they were independent of each other and of the ground. And then we had machines that we would measure the voltages on the walls. When they did their healing, and we started getting voltage changes every time the healer healed. That was pretty entertaining. And you were also videotaping them. Oh, yeah. And so, and we, we did all the records and we did the, had cameras photographing them. And then somebody said, well, maybe it's because they're waving their arms right in this room. 
So then we let a lot of the patients be 50 feet away in another room. And we had the patients wired up, and I measured them. And then we had the healer wired up and measured them. And changes would take place in the patient at the same time as in that the healer would say, I'm sending energy. That, that, that was pretty amazing when you get right down to it because there was no way of denying it because we had the records. But I got a telephone call from a guy in, in St. Paul, Minnesota. And this doctor said, I have a, there's a guy up here that can stop his heart. And I said, oh yeah? He said, he's from India, and he's willing to go any place I want him to go. I said, bring him down to Menninger, and I'll wire him up and find out if he can really do it. And it turned out that he really could, and his name was Swami Rama. And Swami Rama literally could stop his heart. And when we uh, tested him, and I said, well, all right, stop your heart now. And uh, for 17 seconds, it went like, the heart went like that. It fluttered. And, uh, and I said, you know, it never stopped. And he says, well, it doesn't stop dead. It flutters in there. So I took the record down over to Kansas City to, a med to the medical school and said, what is this? And they said, it's called atrial flutter. And, it, and, and there's no more blood going to the brain. And then this man has probably fainted and fallen on the floor. What happened to him? And I said, we took off his wires and he went up and gave his lecture. <laughs> Any, anyone in America who could do anything, then I contacted them. And so, and, and, and as soon as it was possible, then I'd say, come to Menninger. And then they would come and I would arrange the lecture series. It was really pretty entertaining because then Richard Alpert, that is Ram Dass, he became quite well known. And so when he came back from India, I said, hey, you know some stuff, come down to Menninger and, and, and start telling us about it. So he did, and he came down, and I remember arranging a, a lecture in, that, in this big ballroom over there at, Washington, at, the, at the university at Washburn. So there was a good turnout? Yeah, oh, oh, we had a good turnout. We had a lot of fun. After we came to Menninger, I bought a sailboat and took it down to Florida, and, and <clears throat> we went to Florida, and we sailed out through the Bahamas and all around and came back to Florida. And when I put the boat, took the boat out of the water, and I came back to where she was, because she had to wait in the car while I took the boat out of the water, I mean, uh, I had it pulled out with a, with a tractor trailer that was there at the marina, and it was pulled out of the water. And when I went to get her in the car, she said, who are you? And that was the beginning. So, and, and as an Alzheimer patient, she didn't, didn't recognize me. So when I said who I was, then she would remember. And she would remember for at least an hour. And I had to get used to that because that went on for a long time. And so, so that was how come I then began understanding that people who have Alzheimer's are really halfway between this world and that world, and they're right in the middle. And if you know how to talk to them, you can say, who do you meet over there? And they can tell you all these people they meet. And every once in a while, you'll meet, they'll start telling you about what they're learning. Because when people die, they don't vanish. All that happens is they start another school. And people think that Alzheimer's is, is a dementia. 
it's the only thing that's a dementia is applies only to the brain. There's nothing wrong with the mind. But most people, they don't know how to get the information from their mind through the brain because the brain is now damaged. If you have an automobile and, and, and it has a flat tire, there's nothing you can do about it. Some, and you, you can get a new tire maybe for an automobile, but how do you get a new brain? That's what the problem is. Well, I was always every day writing down what happened every day, and finally somebody said, <clears throat> all this information you've got written down, if you put it together in a book form, a lot of people need to know this. Because Elise was telling me things that, that people normally, if you're not an Alzheimer patient, you don't know. And I said, how do you know this? And she says, because I'm halfway between. <clears throat> she said, I'm partly in this world and partly in another world. And I'm stuck right in the middle and I can't go up or down. I can't go forwards or backwards. I said, in that case, let's keep talking. Because as we keep talking, we will gradually find out what's going on. And then she started telling me that there were teachers there. And the teachers are coming and they're telling her, that's all right, just keep on going. And so then finally I realized that the teachers, the kind of teachers that Jesus was talking about, are with us and have always been with us because the least began telling me about the teachers and what the teachers were telling her. And they were telling her, keep on going, keep on going, everything is working, gonna work out okay, and you're going to approach the end of your life, but that's all right, that doesn't make any difference. You have to go through this process. And because of the fact that you're halfway between worlds, you can talk to, Elmer and you can talk to us. And that was when I began to find out that the Alzheimer patient is a special person. And they're beginning to know what they knew when they were four years old. And when they're four years old, they don't know they know it. But when they're, let's say, 80 years old and they have Alzheimer's, and you can, if you know how to talk to them and you can talk to them in the right way, they gradually can tell you what they knew when they were four. And that's how then we can find out about what heaven and hell are like. When did this journey begin for you? When did you start having, you mentioned before having some unusual experiences. When did that start for you that you remember? <laughs> it started when I was three years old. And, and what happened when you were three? Well, I was sitting in an armchair like this and I had my back on one side and my feet on the other side and I was thinking, this isn't such a bad plate world after all. And I don't know why I was thinking that at three years old. And then all of a sudden the walls began changing color. And they changed from normal walls to gold walls. And the ceiling was gold. Then everything was gold. And then I saw a thing that looked like an escalator. Or at least a, it was a beam of light that was like an escalator because there were humans coming down this esc down this beam of light and they were coming down they were all dressed in robes in golden robes and they came down whole crowd of them and the one in the front was wearing a headgear and he had a beard and he looked down at me and he said we are here, you are there, and you have been successfully planted. And I was really astounded. I didn't say anything, I just looked at him. Then the whole thing vanished, gradually. It didn't vanish suddenly, it just 
faded away. And then I was back as a three-year-old, and I knew that these people then were there on the other side. They were there, and I was here. And there were two worlds. And I, th and I took it for granted then that that's the way life is. And I didn't think any more about it until I started high school and got interested in physics and started wondering, where is that place? And so, that, so then I began reading. And I read all the Bibles and religious books and everything. And gradually, I then read the Indian stuff and the American Indian and the East Indian and the healer stuff. I went to, all the, to the spiritualist church and I listened to all the mediums. It was rather entertaining. Aurobindo was another one. And Aurobindo, he didn't start out that way in his early life. In his early life, he went to England and became an Englishman. <laughs> then he went back to India and found out that he, that he actually was an Indian. And he knew everything. He had learned so much and it started coming into his head because he learned how to go into the mind, into the higher mind. Everybody has a, I guess you could say, uh, a normal mind, an unconscious mind, and a higher mind. In the normal mind, you work in everyday life. The unconscious mind has all your karma in it because it's the mind that's with you from the day that you started in your earth school. And that might have been a long time ago. Because they say that on the average, people have to go through hmm, 15 to 1700 repetitions before they've learned all of the things they need to learn. It's a good thing that our high schools aren't that long. But anyway, all of the stuff that they learned in every life is stored and it's stored in their mind. There's not anything that they have forgotten, but it's all stored in the unconscious. Coincidence is everything that you arrange with your brain in this world, but synchronicity is what your soul is arranging. It had nothing to do with your manipulation of the world. If you say, may that which is the best for me come about, then you're allowing the spirit world to decide what it is. That's called, and when it happens, it's synchronicity. It's not coincidence, because you didn't arrange it. Synchronicity is when it's arranged by the spirit. And coincidence is when it's arranged by you, with your brain. And so to allow synchronicity, you have to have detachment. And you have to have detachment, because if, you, if you're attached all the time, you don't allow synchronicity to work. 